Hello. Hey, can you hear us? Okay, okay, I'm here. I'm sorry about that. That was an absolute. Uh, <laughs> that was a disaster. You I'm lied so to me. You said that you knew how to use um, Discord. I, I did. I did, but I'm I'm transitioning into a boomer. Yeah. So I'm you transition. You're transitioning yes. into a boomer. <laughs> yeah. It's really embarrassing. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's the best. I think that might be the best uh, trans joke I've ever heard in my entire fucking life. So. Oh shit! How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I had a bit of a little, a bit of a panic there, but um, I got it all figured out. So I've got me a fancy microphone, and I've got. Me is that a is, is that the title of your memoir? Had a bit of a panic there, but uh, <laughs> I've got it all figured out now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good, pretty <laughs> when you write, when you write, that's, that's going to be the next Substack article. Yeah, uh, that'll be it. Yeah. All right, so chat. This is um, you. How about you like introduce yourself in whatever way that you introduce yourself? Because I've just been saying Tula Bar because that's your name on Twitter. Sure. Yeah, my um, my name is Richie. Um, I'm known as Tula Bar on Twitter. I'm a detransitioned male. I transitioned uh, medically when I was 26 in 2014. Um, which means that I've been on hormones for all that time. I'm on hormones for life. Yes, I am British. I'm from the northeast of England. Um, great place to be, by the way. <laughs> and uh, um, I had a full genital surgery, regrettably, in 2018. Um, you know, results may vary on that one. I'll, I'll go into that later, but... Uh, that's pretty much it. I've, I've detransitioned, um, changed my name back and stuff like that. But for me, if you, what you've got to kind of understand is there really isn't any solid going back for someone like me. I mean, I am on starting to take testosterone again. Um, but even that, you know, it's not gonna, I'm, I'm changed forever. Like, um, and I've got no interest in hulking out and being super masculine and super um hairy on you shit like that because this is the sort of thing that brought us here to begin with you know like this fear of masculinity this fear of uh being a man basically and um, it's like mm. i said before i didn't i didn't transition to be a woman i transitioned to not be a man mm. yeah oh god that's this is gonna be a, this is gonna be an interview. <laughs> that was just your introduction. Uh, so you're saying you're not gonna you're not gonna go uh, go on Amazon and like buy a bunch of like Go Goku muscle shirts and start like packing in the whey protein and hitting the gym any anytime soon like too hardcore. You haven't bought your super male vitality yet from AlexJones.com. <laughs> yeah, I need to I need to do that. <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, Whatever turned the frogs gay, so have you turned me super gay? <laughs> super gay. <laughs> so your gender yeah. identity will become super straight, but it'll just it'll go so far into the horseshoe into super gay. Oh well, it's really nice to have you. Um, this all started because, well, okay. Well, first of all, you know, on this channel, I've done a lot of debates and I've done a lot of discussions from you know a position that is many people have labeled me like very radically right wing, um, but we're you know we're radical libertarians. Like, I don't really care what anybody does with their body. I don't care what anybody does with the way that they express their gender. Um, you know, my position has, you know, I, you know, as I've educated myself, maybe like changed a little bit or kind of like reinformed itself and, you know, in theory a little bit, but my position has always been, or for the most part, it's been that like, you know, gender is rooted in some way in biology, um, that it is, but it is a role like I kind of take a middle ground there. I don't do that like kind of like, no, like, you know, there's no such thing as gender roles. It's just man and woman uh, and, you know, male and female, exactly the same thing. I'm like, well, OK, yeah, but there is a role that is played that is associated with that. Um, but that ultimately um, you're playing at that other thing, right? You're 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 putting on a performance. It's a performative thing to try and be and live in that role. And if that's what you want to do, you know, society should respect that in a certain degree, but that doesn't mean that we have to go off of the rails and destroy the idea that gender exists, right? Um, or that like, you know, there is no such thing as a gender binary or like, you know, like ignore biology and things like that. And most importantly, I think the thing that really kind of how, where I started to find D-trans individuals such as yourself um, was just the, 
utter concern once I really started researching, you know, critical theory, critical pedagogy, um, you know, and and the way that gender ideology is so deeply rooted in Marxist philosophy, um, and 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 realizing that it is in many ways this collectivist kind of political movement, and it is infected teachers and our schooling and education system and it's affected the APA which is you know the American Psychological Association kind of the gold standard here in America for licensing psychiatrists and psychologists where gender affirming care is now the default right there's no discussion of why there's very why is it that autism is is so closely linked um to gender transition there's no discussion of um cluster b personality disorders and their extremely high prevalence in 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 the trans community and there's no discussion of you know, like it's it's just assumed for whatever reason that it's medically healthy to go on gnrh antigen you know puberty blockers and that hormone replacement therapy is you know because of the suicidality rate is just the go-to everyone gets hrt and if you disagree with this like you're a right-wing bigot um, and so it just doesn't make medical sense to me. And, you know, and I feel like, you know, I think the most important thing above whatever political ideology you have, be you left wing and you think that gender is silly and we kind of should, should all just embrace, you know, the freedom of our bodies and the expression of it, or be you right wing and you're like, you know, like, no, you know, families are the most important thing in the world. Whatever that is, I think truth is the most important thing. And in the moment we lose that as a society where politics start to supersede truth, we get into an extremely dangerous and volatile place in our, in our, in our culture. And so I started finding D-trans individuals such as yourself and I read your sub stack. Um, well, I didn't read all of your sub stack, right? I'm gonna be honest. Like I didn't do that much research. Right. Um, but yeah, I was like, but I like saw one of the lost boys and was like, Oh, this is interesting. And so then I saw the one, no pictures, please. And I was like, and, I'm going to be real with you, right? My first thought was, no pictures, please. Oh, fuck, I can't interview this person. <laughs> and then I read the article and I was like, oh, like, you know what I mean? Like telling the story through the, your kind of camera shyness, the dysphoria through your camera shyness and like the, the years of your life that disappeared because of the dysphoria that you have, like that there's like, almost like, it's almost like being like, unpersoned but you did it to yourself you unpersoned yourself to avoid yeah, well, the camera I mean, it wasn't dysphoria it was like self-esteem um, and mm -hmm. shame you know but dysphoria is an easy cop out from those things because those are two big things that need looked at individually anyway but dysphoria is like i said it's an all-inclusive um package for for many comorbid things that are can operate in tandem whether you're bullied you had some attachment issues you had trauma you know autistic or adhd um gender non-conforming or a little bit gay all these things mm -hmm. are much easier to deal with when you look at it through the lens of gender dysphoria because it's like oh that's the reason all these issues exist because of this rather than breaking down and doing the work that needs to be done because it does take a lot to unpack these issues individually um, because it also has to deal with trust and trust in yourself and um, well and facing up to a lot of your own difficulties as well you know and um, but the second that I learned about gender dysphoria it was like an obsession because I'm um, diagnosed OCD and um, lots of people who are D-trans are highly OCD um, that either have had a diagnosis or the, they exhibit symptoms, but that's comorbid between, sorry, not comorbid, that's, um, that's quite common amongst autistic people anyway, and people with ADHD. Um, and like the, as you were saying, like the prevalence of gender dysphoria amongst autistic people is one in 20, whereas in mm. the general population, it's one in 250. Um, but also the, there's all these link overs um, and again, it's like the answers are right in front of us. We, we know why it is that way. It's because it's, you know, you can be farmed essentially as a medicalized trans person. 
um, and you can think that these are all your issues too when in fact the there are a lot of issues that you you need to deal with in isolation yeah um for the audience uh comorbid um in some i was i was really confused so i had to google it and then i realized that in canada and the uk they use concurrent and they use comorbid just for deaths uh but in the us we use comorbid just with them both okay um just just clearing that up i was like what not comorbid and then i was like oh oh that's interesting um so yeah um i guess there's really only one place to start which is kind of we're here <laughs> um thank you first of all before i ask like you know the kind of the timeline of your life thank you for doing this um i've seen a lot of the hate that um that d trans people get online I, i've honestly ne i've never seen any particular if you will identity or group right small as it may be receive more online hatred than d trans individuals like ever I've, I've like because like I've, I've noticed that with trans people obviously they they experience a lot of hate from people um but there is at the same time a supportive network as well as a kind of political movement and you know terms of service and kind of rules online that kind of work to at least in some ways shield them from the worst and work as a a, a network of people that kind of support them right um yeah. And yet with D-trans people, and this has been my outside experience, so I guess I would ask you about it, but with D-trans people, I've seen just straight up hate from like everybody, regardless of political ideology, whether they're on the right, the left, or anything, it just seems to come from all sides. Like, wh what has that been like, like kind of bravely stepping into the public sphere and putting yourself out there? Um, well, firstly, I would say that Everything that we've done, like the D-trans males, has, we know what we're doing. Um, and it is a risk. You're right, it is a risk. Um, it's a risk to family, it's a risk to your job and all that sort of thing. But I think with me D-transition came a great deal of fuck this, you know? Like, I really, really don't give a shit anymore about what people think or what people say really really don't care because that for me was what transition was supposed to be it was supposed to be a release from this constant like worrying that people's eyes are on you and judging you and um examining you even though they're not and when i do transition that kind of got switched off and with that kind of the fear went as well and um i thought about it long and hard and it was just like at the end of the day i'm done anything wrong so I'm not really bothered what to say. Um, a lot of the people who are trans, who give us the most grief, um, you know, I understand why they're, they're like that, you know? It's like an attack on their trauma and their identity because mm. a lot of trans people map their trauma onto their identity. Yes. Um, so when you attack their identity, you're kind of attacking their trauma in a way. So I understand that and that's fine, but if you think that I'm just going to sit there with my hands clasped and say thank you and yes please and you know um, and, and play along like as as I was essentially a, a invited to by um, various different parties like you know you be the good one that just shuts the fuck up and just says um, what you're supposed to and I was just like ah fuck all that shit I'm just going to do what I need to do you know and D-trans males do it in a very different way we're kind of like you know um we're just a bit messy in the way we do things and it works yeah what, yeah like what do you mean what, yeah it's what the conversation needs you know that they, they need a little bit of how should we say um boyishness in it uh, i guess you know a little bit of uh whatever go fuck yourself um and just just do it but also um i think a lot of that fear that exists is is made a lot of people not want to speak out but you know i'm again i'm really really not worried um i can't quite explain why i'm not worried but i suppose it's because i've done a lot of preparation in the background to um mitigate any issues in my life um beautiful cat by the way um 
Oh, cat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, oh, there's two cats. Oh my god. Oh, I've got cats no, as well. No, it's uh, um, it's the it's the same cat. That's. Oh, oh it's the same cat. All oh, right, shit. That just blew my. And then fucking... the doggo. And then the doggo on all the right, floor. Let's see. Okay. Now, all right. There is two cats, cats, but the other cat is far more stealthy. All right. I had no <laughs> idea. That was the same cat. I was just like, oh, that's another one. <laughs> Anyway, this is how it got lured into this. I'm so like, oh, look at that. <laughs> Ooh, so, you, so you, so you, what, it, correct me if I'm wrong. What you would say is that like the experience of, of detransing, right. And like, and, and coming to terms with your identity and like the, the self work that you've done on your identity and already like the pain of kind of the permanence of many of the decisions that you've had and having to accept those things. It's like, you know, some Christian dude like yelling at me that I'm an abomination in a DM on Twitter is like, like dog, like it's nothing comparatively. Mm. Um, or I would mean, you, or but the totality of it, you know what I mean? It, or like, like, would you say that like for you, like it gave you like a fuck all attitude, but like for maybe others, it's, it's too much. I'm like, I'm trying to really nail it down a little bit, I guess. I'd, I don't know if it that was linked. Maybe it was a little bit linked to the surgery, actually. Maybe that is quite a good observation because it's like, what can anyone possibly do that I haven't done it myself already? Um, and that's fine. And also, I've got that layer of protection that I come at this from the angle of... Um, I come at this from the angle of, like, somebody who's gay, whereas a lot of the detrans... Well, not a lot of... In fact, our group, I would say, is about 60% gay. And the rest are either asexual or bi. Um, and there are a few straight people are there too. But what you would describe as typical um, AGP, which stands for autogynophilia, which is the sexual arousal of seeing oneself as a woman, um, which is a term coined by um, somebody called Blanchard, who you would have to get the Google on. Oh yeah, no, uh, I've, it's it's something it's something that I uh, okay as a streamer well, as a streamer I will say this uh, Twitch is very um, there like there are a lot of interesting things that I would love to delve into but we also have to recognize that I'm like I'm gonna get you banned no no you're not gonna get me banned you're not gonna get me banned because it's coming from you <laughs> That's, it's coming from you uh, is part of the reason but like you know there's uh you know there's a lot of things that you know uh, autogonophilia and connections with narcissistic personality disorder specifically covert and vulnerable narcissistic personality yeah. disorder and things of that nature like i've actually but i've, I've done a fair amount of research into it but it's something i don't typically delve into because it's the kind of thing that really gets you in the hot seat but yeah no i'm i but i'm i'm, I'm here for it for the conversation with you for sure yeah um but those people get the most flack mm -hmm. yeah uh, in the sphere they are most definitely at the bottom of the pecking order um everyone hates them so even if they um even if they don't dress or practice whatever the fuck the the people want them to do they essentially want them to restrict themselves um whatever I'm not <laughs> too much because uh anyway no i know yeah, if, if you have something you want to say say it for sure yeah, I mean, well, I was just letting you know why there was like a little bit of like, oh, <laughs> yeah. well, the thing is that there's a lot of judgment against male sexuality and how it develops and how it plays out. What happens if you if certain factors are in play and how that can manifest itself. Um, but the, the same sort of talking isn't quite given to to women. And it's like. They all, they only transitioned because they were all traumatized or whatever. But it, there's this like constant refusal to say that a lot of their transition is actually sexually fueled too. Because if you look at Helena's story, for instance, mm. um, Helena talks a lot about this, about like the fan fiction community. And I've seen so many um, FTM trans people like, get into that sort of thing. And it is very sexually fueled. It's just a different type of what you would call an erotic target. Um, whereas 
the sort of male version of that is very much from the inside. Regardless, because I am gay and not attracted to um, women, basically, I get a much easier time, actually, despite all the shit that has happened on my Twitter. I get it a lot easier than other dudes, um, but I still do get a lot of shit. Um, but at this point, I've got quite a really strong network behind us. I've got quite a lot of big names behind me, too. Yes. Um, so um, I feel quite confident in that sense. Not that they're going to come in and pick up pieces, not, nothing like that. But it, it makes it very, very hard not to speak out when you've got that sort of attention and backing. You know what I mean? So I think they, when I say they, I'm talking like, um, J.K. Rowell and Maya Forrester and all those sort of people who uh, J.K. is like um, tweeters, Helen Joyce. These are all big names in the like in the gender critical area as well. Obviously, everyone knows who J.K. Rowell is. One. Yeah, yeah, we've all read um, Harry Potter. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone knows. I got, I got to go read yeah. Harry Potter again to see where the misogyny was. Oh, the misogyny. <laughs> I got to find it. Yes. I haven't been able to find it, chat, but one day. One day I'll I'll find that one phrase and be like, aha, this is where it all started. <laughs> no, I think I, I think I figured it out. It's that it's Harry Potter, not Harriet Potter. Oh. Harriet Potter. I mean, to be fair, she did do like a pseudo name and write like a a serial killer a serial killer novel with a transvestite, which yeah, is like good. which is like yeah. it's pretty tropish there, uh, JK. Like I feel like you knew what you were doing with that one. <laughs> Just to be fair. Uh so um yeah so i guess yeah I, i'd love to bring this in now more towards you, kind of like your personal story and like mm -hmm. you know kind of in a timeline of events because i think so much of our audience especially focuses on the the way that children are targeted because we're a very libertarian audience so we are not as gender critical as maybe um conservatives might be in the sense that like we wouldn't typically see a someone in their early 20s that wants to be you know gender non-conforming or or something of that regard as like you know necessarily a bad thing like i mean i myself have openly stated multiple times that like i find certain trans girls super hot and like i don't care um that's just me um but at the same time i think the the point the part that really scares a lot of people and really concerns a lot of people is younger impressionable minds and the way that this industry has built up in such a way and the way the communities and cultures have built up in such a way that they're all being pushed in one direction in many ways actively pushed in that direction um especially once we start looking at transformative social emotional learning here in the united states um that doesn't exist in the uk um no. have you have you have you looked into that um, not not totally. I I kind of feel like what's happening with schools and gender ideology and in there isn't my lane, so to speak, because the way that that's unfolding is a totally alien experience to to what I went through. Mm. Um, the way I would describe it is I was part of the millennial cohort of transitioners in two thousand and twelve to two thousand and fourteen. And uh, what millennials do um, informs what Gen Z does. Yes. Uh, whether or not they want to admit that or not, unfortunately, they they do look up to to millennials, and millennial does um, support Gen Z. It's like, it's like little big brother sort of relationship. Mm. Um, it's an interesting so, way of put. It. I never I never really thought of it like that, but that yeah. is kind of that is kind of true, right? Like because boomers and Gen parents, Xers yeah. are just like a totally different thing. And yeah. like millennials and Gen Z, there's this kind of like much more closeness between between the the ability to commute. I'm like I myself am a millennial, and as are you. And you know, like I don't really have any issues speaking to Gen Z, and a lot of the audience is Gen Z. Um, the only thing I don't get is their stupidity when it comes to comedy. They don't. They, they have no such thing as comedy. They're poor children. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I guess I would to hone it in. Like, where do you feel like your struggles and your questioning? And like, where did this start for you? The internet. It was the internet and that's the compounding sort of 
the commonality all detransitioners, male or female, face. Um, I've not heard or talked to one, and I'm in a few detrans groups, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. literally hundreds of people, and they're all talk about the internet. They all talk about it, whether it being an early influence. So I've been using the internet since I was like nine or ten years old, um, and the internet back in the late 90s was a very, very different place to the, the internet. The way yeah. it is now. And you're both smiling because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, I all know, you know, it was unregulated, completely unregulated. Fucking mental. It was up. And, you know, I was like addicted to the computer anyway. Um, and I was addicted to the internet when we eventually did get the internet when I was, we got it about two years after we got the computer. Um, or a year after, because I remember all my friends had the internet before we did, and I was always going around to the house so we could go in chat rooms, because um, we thought it was fucking amazing, you know, you could talk to anyone in the world. So we'd be like, hi everyone, my name's Richie, and my name's Soso, I'll not say his name, um, we're two 10-year-old boys, and we just want to talk from people all over the world, here's our telephone number. <laughs> And it except was just except you were 10 and the other person was 35 pretending to be yeah 10. basically, basically <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, they weren't really even pretending at that stage it was just like we just didn't know better and um as i got older and i had the internet myself like only two or three years older like 12 13 um um now speaking to strangers on the internet on chat rooms and msn and icq um and all the sort of thing and uh it just it was just really it, it got really toxic i don't want to go too much into that but i, I was hooked in from the get-go um i had a, i had an awful time as a teenager anyway online offline in school um medically I, i'm half deaf because i had um, a really bad infection in one of my ears that required surgery and uh and it meant that i don't have um, an eardrum in my left ear now. Um, anyway, that's that that's awful. <laughs> mm. Sorry, sorry, I, that came I'm out sorry. like a joke, joking tone. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I've got like I've got like twenty percent, but I've got a bone anchored hearing aid as well. But it, it's not in at the minute because I've got this in. Um, don't worry, I can I can hear fine. It's just um, it's kind of like reading glasses, as it were. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes, like if I'm watching TV or a movie, I have to have it in. Otherwise, I just can't hear it. Um. So, anyway, so the, the so you're saying there wasn't like a antecedent for you, like there wasn't like a like a, a a specific like, um, you know, because you don't describe your situation as one as dysphoria. You describe yourself as dysphoria being a catch-all phrase that that um yeah. that helped you deal with shame and guilt and trauma yeah. and you know ocd and autism and you know and and all of these other things and it's like ah the answer can all be wrapped up into a nice neat little bow if only i transition i'll be yeah. the person that i want to be the the ideal kind of figure that i've now created for myself via kind of like the socialization of the internet process and sexuality yeah. as well um but like you what was and if you're uncomfortable stating it, we can move on. But like, like, what do you think in your life was the antecedent? Like what led up to the internet being such a, cause obviously everyone that used the internet didn't become a transitioner, right? <laughs> um, like what, what, what was it going on in that world? You think that like left you so vulnerable? Um, I think I, you know, I was what I was gay. Mm -hmm. I, I was, I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I give that up, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, so I couldn't, and I also grew up at the time of Section Twenty Eight, which at, in the UK was a ban on LGBT education. So you know, there was only negative stuff happening, and I wanted to talk to gay people. I hadn't accepted I was gay, but I wanted to talk to them, mm. and that led me down to the path in the chat rooms, thinking I'm talking to other. 13 14 year olds and it it wasn't other 13 14 year olds and th that got into a messy whole sort of um 
yeah, that that there was a there was a period then where it was really really bad. Um, to be honest, and I will not go too much into that. But I was very much um, addicted to to that attention, even though I knew it was really wrong and negative. Mm. And that carried on till in in the early twenties as well. But when I was dealing, when I start trying to start to deal with all these issues, when I was about twenty one, I kind of had a breakdown at me in my doctors. It was like, um, here's what I'm coping with, and I've described all the intense. Um, symptoms of OCD like it was really severe like I was going through all the ritualistic behavior of checking locks and doing these crazy actions and it would take us hours to go to sleep because if I didn't if I got it wrong I would have to do it again I had really horrific intrusive thoughts they made us you know they made you want to kill yourself or violent and all sorts um, all the things that you're not as a person and you know you're not, it causes a great deal of conflict because you think, why the fuck am I thinking about this? Um, and you kind of, you know, th that can be extremely um, powerful because it can, it, it motivated me to want to medicalize myself. But anyway, I'm back at the doctors and I'm, I'm describing all these OCD symptoms. So he gives a sertraline, which is an SSRI, and I'm, I'm on that now. I'm on quite a I'm on a very high dose um, and I've been on that since like, when was it, 2011, mm -hmm. so about 11 years now. Um, and then as, as, as I got So this would have been at 24. 2011, how old was I then? I would have been about 23, 23 okay. turning 24. Okay, okay. Um, and then they offered a little bit of um, therapy with that, but it was all the like the low level nurse therapy. Like you get six sessions with a nurse practitioner, and I love nurses to bits, but I needed proper psychological help, and I knew I needed proper psychological help, so I was just trying to skip past that. And then I, I was seeing a psychologist um, who wasn't specialised in OCD treatment, but he was a general psychologist. Um, and about seven or eight months into these sessions, which were kind of going well, we started talking about a little bit about OCD, but he wasn't specialized. And then at that moment, at that time, I'd found the online trans community and I was obsessed. And I was, I was like, it's all, it's all this. He literally the week before I'd talked to us about pure all, which is like a form of OCD, which is like very, very dehabilitating. Um, it's like constant, it's not, it's like all the time, 24-7. Right. Um, and, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. Right, uh, so you're you're eight months in with the psychologist that doesn't specialize in OCD and is maybe not aware or paying particular attention to the fact that you're explaining your newfound obsession online in the online yeah. trans community um, but it's obviously funneled through your OCD in the yeah. need to know every detail, the need to, to tie everything personally to your life in some capacity. That's right. And then I was just like, I've got gender dysphoria. And he was like, ooh, I don't know if qualified about that. He wasn't qualified with the OCD stuff either. He was just a, he was like just a general psychologist. He was lovely, but, he, you know, it was just very general. And then um, that started me on the, on the pathway from then um, and I was extremely adamant about it um, and I was faced with a two-year waiting list in the UK gender clinic service so mm -hmm. I paid for a private assessment um, I was on minimum wage I, I was earning minimum wage near minimum wage till like 2019 because um, everyone's like oh you're rich you're funded and I'm like fuck you I'm like poor as fuck bastard you know what I mean you yeah, send us some message and um, <laughs> you're anyway. just a grifter for the money. <laughs> yes, I'm a grifter. <laughs> Here's my PayPal. Here's my cash app. <laughs> it's funny how like people say that and they got that on like the Twitter bio and you're like, oh fuck off. Um, and I I was faced with this long way, and I'd learned on the trans forum, which I went on, and that's a different story. Um, they had just basically told us where to go and what to do and i took out oh, a payday yeah. loan which is one of these high percent apr mm. loan 
um, to get these private assessments, which was like 500 pounds. And within like, I think it was like three days and three appointments. On one day, I went to see the initial psychiatrist and then I had to go for a second opinion to a colleague, but I did it on the same day. And then I came back a few oh, days later disgusting. to see it. And then I got the full, full diagnosis of her and I was able to start the blockers. But I also had a very delayed puberty. So I didn't start going through puberty till I was like 16. And because of that, by the time I was 24, by the 25, sorry, by the time I had blockers, I was just able to start growing like full beard and stuff. So I had facial hair and I still like do, even though it's had laser and stuff like that. But I hadn't like properly masculinized, if you know what I mean. Um, but I was definitely like a man. I was just not like, you know, the difference between like a 20 year old and a 40 year old man is like, there's just a difference physically between them, you know, and it's the years of testosterone. I just hadn't had whatever that was. So as soon as yeah, I- you didn't have this. I got it. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I didn't have the thick beard. I'd, I had like this, the shit, shitty, fluffy beard crap. In, in America, in America, we call that peach fuzz. Peach fuzz, yeah. You no, know, they had stubble and patches. I have peach fuzz. Okay. <laughs> well, Mark, Mark has uh, alopecia, so Mark doesn't really grow hair. Bless him. <laughs> he got, he got, he got, he got laser removal therapy for free, basically at puberty, for his entire That's body. <laughs> But this isn't about me. So. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so okay. I want I want to touch on something interesting. Like as as we go through, you're saying that even in the kind of the mid 2010s, right, that there were private clinics set up that were relatively cheap. I know that you know they weren't for you, obviously, yeah. um, but that relatively cheap, where you could get an opinion and a second opinion and a diagnosis, and be on um, puberty blockers or maybe uh, correct me if i'm wrong it hrt was an it was an anti-androgen called so like the, yeah. okay so like commonly in america we we use grnh antigen therapies but like a puberty yeah. blocker of some of some form um yeah. with like 500 what it would it be like 600 dollars at the time 600 us bucks you could get you could make meet all of the legal requirements that were intended to make this something that people that are only seriously about this to do, right? Which is that you go get an opinion from one person and get opinion from another. The idea being that like, you're not going to do this unless you're really serious, but $600 in an obsession and you're on puberty blockers. Uh, yeah, I brought me mother at one of the appointments as well, cause she was worried that she knew me and I was, I, I had a breakdown, like a really big, like very bad mental breakdown mm -hmm. not long before this as well. And she was really worried about me anyway. So she went with me to the one of the next appointments and um, she had a word with the the, ther the the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist just absolutely like tore out a bit and try like, she was like this awful parent who, you know, cause I was, I was, I know I was like 25 and shit, but I was like a vulnerable person, you know, I suppose still am. You know, I was very, very far behind socially and stuff like that. Intelligent, just very, very, you know, you can, I was just feckless in a way. Um, and she was like shouting my mother down about mm. all these things like me anxiety, me depression and, and all these other things. And the fact that I was on medication for me OCD. And she was just like, yeah, that's because he's trans and you know if you don't help him you know you're causing a problem here and um i i brought her there known because she wasn't on board and i brought her there knowing that she would take that sort of thing from a from a psychiatrist as as like proof you know what i mean mm. like if she wasn't gonna hear it from me she was hear it from her Right, so was there already like a, a disconnect between your family and your familial relationships kind of before this process began? Um, or yeah. or was it like, it, was it exacerbated? Like, like what was that like in terms of your familial support system in, in this kind of timeline? 
Right, so uh, my mother and father are, are divorced and both remarried and from about the age of 16 to 23, I would say about 24, it, I had a very strange relationship with my dad and it was very like, you know, we, we started making effort and it was, it was getting better, it was getting better and then I transitioned and it just severed it completely like mm. he didn't know what to do at all this is a my dad was a miner right so and an engineer and just trying to imagine like i'm coming at him with this and he's he's like what is this i don't understand it i don't agree with it and this is what i was expecting to hear um and i just made it easy for him just not get in touch and my brother who is older um and was like an ex-paratrooper um and you know he's he's a he's a tough guy as well and he was like what the fuck you know mm. uh, the first words he said to me when i was like i've got something to tell you he smiled and he went you're gay aren't you and i went no it's actually worse than that i'm trying <laughs> he was like i've been prepping for this for the last 10 years because well, it's like is... look son i know you're gay and yeah. then you're like no, no no i'm a woman bigot and he's just like yeah the fuck like i like this yeah. like left field like oh right. man this oh is that's exactly so crazy my said as well my mother was like i when i said i'm trans and she was like are you sure you're not just gay and i was like no 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 i'm trans i i know i've done the research it's just like giving that crazy eyes you know what i mean and um, I was just hellbent, her words, hellbent. You can tell us anything. Have you been able, uh, as, as detransing and things, have you been able to, to shore up or repair those relationships? Or has this yeah, process me, kind of burned a lot of those bridges? So me, me mother was always supportive and she was always there because she was like, even though, like I was never horrible, but I was a very adamant and it upset her a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. And she always like stuck by, but the t the day trans stuff really did take the wind about sales. She was like, I need a, like this, you know, after everything sort of thing. But she, she loves us and supports us and everything like that. And we are close. So it was just like, I need a little bit of space sort of thing. When you say uh, us, you mean siblings, like... Um, me and me dad, me and me dad. Sorry, oh, okay. ask I say us in place of me because of my dialect, and I'm really sorry about that. No, Confused. no, no, it's fine. It's no, it's know. fine. I just wanted to make sure, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, yeah. So me and me, me and my mother's relationship is uh, quite good. Um, also, I have an older sister, but that that she was always fine, but she's like five years older, so it was always that you know it's just a different dynamic when your sisters are siblings that much older than you you know um i have a 15 year i have a 15 year old sister <laughs> yeah oh wow right okay, 16 that, years that older quite, than her it's like i'm basically yeah, an quite, uncle yeah i know right that's like a whole different generation but it's obvious not so much um but in terms of those relationships it i didn't detransition despite what a lot of people will say about acceptance and family i didn't do it for them because you know i'm like eight nine years in a transition but when i detransitioned so this was like old news and i wasn't yearning for it it was just i'd accepted it long ago that that's the way it was um and that's not the reason why i detransitioned and it certainly hasn't changed much in those relationships or not yet at least i don't think it will and so, I'm not holding out for it too either. So moving forward a little bit, um, you know, you go to the clinic, you're in the two year waiting list for HRT and for kind of like gender affirming consistent care with the gender clinic. Cause at the yeah. time that you're doing this, there should only be one, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, my knowledge of the UK is a little bit limited, but there's only one gender clinic at the time that you're doing yeah. this or no? No, no, at the time there was seven. Okay. Um, but the way the waiting times, because this is when it really started to peak, there was never a waiting time like it was by the time I'd entered the service. That ex they experienced a rapid increase from around 2011 to 2012. That 
created this huge backlog that they weren't, you know, they were equipped to deal with what the numbers that they expected. And then in 2011 and 12, when RODD, which, you know, I used to think was a lot of shit, is actually quite, quite real, I'm afraid. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? that you have a thick that's, accent. That's, <laughs> sorry, that's rapid onset gender Oh, dysphoria. okay, yes, R-O-D-D. okay. Um, when that when that came in, um, that was around 2010, 2011 when it really started, when the sensation really started. And I think social media has a big part of playing it. It exploded in 2014 because of Tumblr um, and Reddit and YouTube. Those were those were the big ones that really, really propelled it forward. Interesting. And so, you know, I, I mean, I've heard of the link between Internet and, um, you know, kind of the radicalization of, of that process. But it's just very interesting to hear it so adamantly like, no, 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 this is what did it right. Like like from your personal experience and from from what you've researched, you know, it seems that you you draw like 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 you make no qualms about it like no the internet did this yeah right right like like it, which is not something you you tend to hear um outside of maybe the space that, that you're in you you know you tend to hear that it's an influence and that there there's all these multitude of influences and like what is it that you think that like i know that you're obviously your personal experience but like what is it that has you so convinced that um internet chat rooms and discussions and things like that are are so much maybe maybe under focused on um well you've got to keep in mind that the this really does lure in people who are vulnerable Mm -hmm. Mm and people very rarely do you get people who transition who have got an extremely like great support background and they've got gender dysphoria for whatever reason and they are you know, and transition is the right thing for them and they need to do it. Most people are extremely vulnerable and they've got a a variety of different issues and they go into these spaces where now what happens is you go into the likes of Discord, which is an absolute fucking shit show for groomers to the point where Discord actually had to change its terms of service. They don't, uh, they, they don't enforce that at all. I know they don't, but it, it, it's, <laughs> just, it's just an app. It's a shit show. Mm. Um, and basically what happens is a vulnerable person comes on and they have this fun. It's like fantastical, you know, it's like now it's like fair, fair. You know, you can be a fairy or a moth or a bug. And it's like, it's just all about fantasy. And these people know exactly what they're doing when they're luring them in. And you get, it's always older people trying to crack eggs of younger people. Just like it was when I went in these trans forums in 2011, 2012, when they convinced me I was trans because they started showing pictures, especially pictures of me like dressed up and stuff. And it's like much older males who at this point have had a few more decades worth to think about all their issues. And they are now projecting their issues in a sort of a sexual targeted way onto younger males. Um, and this is what a lot of people don't really understand what's happening in the trans community and especially on the male side is these these so-called predatorial males that are apparently a risk to women or girls are a far larger risk to young men and boys mm. because they are they just sexualize the shit out of us and they go they go crazy for it and we're attention starved and like for me I was like dealing with trying to like reconcile me feelings of being gay and trying to explore that in a way that I couldn't do it anywhere else and people just took advantage of that and that kind of is what's happening in other communities they're just taking advantage of people's vulnerability and uh, very rarely do you get people who are drawn in because it's it's right for them and it's a good thing In, in fact if you look behind it there's a serious internet addiction behind it a lot of people are like just completely 24 7 online all the time and you know i think it's the lack of seeing other people and just this constant flow of information as well imagine being affirmed all the time because you're only in these spaces that do so it's like it's like an mk ultra experiment in a way if you think about it. imagine somebody strapped down to a table seeing messages all day every day 
what would that do to you? Now, what happens when it's on your phone and it's on your computer, it's on your TV and it's on your, it's on all your interests, 24 seven, being beamed to you, being beamed to you, you know? Um, that well, is I mean, and now oh. it's, now it's in your school. Yeah, it is. <laughs> That, that's the next pulpit. That's the next. Oh God! I, I don't know. I I I'm sorry. I like I I I'm almost I I almost want to cry. Like because I I've seen like just a tiny inkling of this in this space. You know, one of the you know, we try and avoid drama um, streams. Um, and like you know, but like one of the few times we've ever engaged on that in Twitch has been from essentially a very similar experience. Another person that's involved in the space that claims to be 21 is, we have other information that points that they're older than that, you know, claims to be trans, but doesn't voice mod and doesn't show themselves. Um, you know, claims to be six foot eight, claims to be a motorcycle rider and also, you know, got into, you know, a, a fairly well-known relationship with, uh, with an underage uh, male to female. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and it was like, you know, and it was obvious grooming behavior and then it kind of just yeah. went away and they came back and I was like, no, fuck this person. I'm, I'm showing all of the DMS that they, that they release. I'm showing the interviews again. And it was like me and a couple other people were one of the few people that were willing to be like, fuck this person. And it's just been nothing but apologia from, from the rest of like Twitch politics community, if you will. And to hear that say like, no, 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 no. this is exactly what happens in terms of not just the sexual predation but like really understanding like no 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 you have to stop decoupling the transition and the gender affirmingness along with the sexual predation that occurs in online spaces um which almost sounds like when you it almost sounds conspiratorial right because you're so used to a predominant narrative that like you know um that kind of just completely would deny that in any regards and then, of course, there's very little sex research, like at all. Like, I mean, when you try and find good sex research, part of it is because it's a smaller community. But but, but there's just there's very little research on online exposure, or correlations with certain things or, you know, looking. There, in is, there is. It's just labeled differently. It's just like people are looking for it in this context, but you need to expand that context. Mm -hmm. of, um, so, for instance, if you want to find out about how does online abuse impact people that there will be surveys uh, sorry not there'll be studies just for that um because there's obviously um a lot of work that goes into um you know research and um the impact on victims in all forms of abuse and it's like what what we try to do is how does this impact people who have gender dysphoria and there's no studies for that and it's like course there isn't because this is a new term we need to like ditch that and look outwards at the the other terms mm -hmm. uh, that already are, are on stock you know um but there is research there um and it's just like i've got a feeling that the people who carry this out either know or they are willfully ignorant and really, really do believe. A lot of people believe with their heart this is the right thing, um, but it's not, unfortunately. I think it's a cheaper and more profitable way to treat autism, childhood trauma, especially childhood trauma, and I'll tell you. And the reason why I'm so confident about that is look at the percentage of kids from foster care um, and looked after care situations that enter the way into gender clinics it's five percent it's it's crazy amount of kids it's like absolutely mental um you know yeah sorry went off on one no we're completely off the rails but it's okay i'm, I'm comfortable with it like uh you know th there's an adhd tag on our stream <laughs> for a reason all right all right boys um so Getting back to the timeline, right? You've taken your mother to the private gender clinic. Um, you've gotten antigen therapy. Um, you've kind of had your mother, and I don't, hopefully, I'm not mischaracterizing this when I say this shortly or tersely, uh, kind of berated on your behalf to kind yes. of, you know, to, to, to force the support system um, kind of around you that you 
honestly desperately need no matter what decision you're making. Yeah. Um, um, where where do you go from there? How does how does your story move on past that? So, I oh God. So this would have been I started the Gozorillin Zolosoft, whatever it's called. I always get the name. I always fuck up the pronunciation. It's the stupid pronunciation. Beautiful <laughs> dog. Um, and. I was on the on that by April and socially transition, changed my name. I was a, appearing female. Um, I didn't. I did not look, despite the 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 lack of um, masculine features. I was still quite boyish, you know. And uh, I I did not look like a woman at all for about a year and a half. Um, but I was convinced I did. Like a hundred percent, I was like. Interesting. You were convinced that you were passing, and you weren't. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, absolutely. Oh. Like at the start, because of the online stuff. So you would take loads of photos, and then you delete the ones you didn't quite like, and then you would post that, and then everyone would give you praise, and then you think part of yourself thinks that that that's a real representation of you, when in fact it's not. It's a representation it's really of the online community. Uh, yeah, it's just this this like projected image that you put out there of yourself mm. when it's it's not really you. It's it's kind of I wasn't I'd, my my sort of justification for me was like oh I'm not using filters because I had quite clear skin anyway, and I was like uh, oh I'm not I'm not using filters. It's it's okay. I'm not cheap yourself, but I was like literally like doing all the angles like you know like <laughs> like when when the world is, that shit where they're like, oh, you know, looking it's like, like, it's like, like, like alien. Yes, that's it. It's like, oh, like you can get any more. Why does every picture? Why does every picture of you have the ground in it? Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I still have a masculine jaw. You can't see it though. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, and then you know I was doing voice exercise, and then all of a sudden, about a year in to for the for not having any testosterone or any hormones at all in my body. So it's like two years with no hormones, which is really bad for you. Yeah, I was uh, about to say like health-wise, like what is that doing to you two years without any hormones? Um, well, at the time I didn't really notice. It's like an overtime thing, you know? Um, mm. But now I've got like, I've got curvature in the spine, back pain. I've lost like, like if I was to stand up straight, I'd like properly straight. I, I can kind of straighten out and get my original height in a way, but I've got like this weird slanty curve now because of the loss of said. bone density. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've lost I've lost a few centimeters from my height as well um, because of that, which isn't great because um, that can lead on to other back pain problems. Sorry again, I'm, I'm rambling on about. It's back okay. Pain. I'm six foot five. I know all about lower back pain. I'm here for it. <laughs> I was born with lower back pain. <laughs> but yeah, so two years. Um... Uh, so I'm two years in, um, and all of a sudden I just start like blended in really well, and it was because I just looked completely like androgynous, um, and you know, and no one really knew how to how to sort of ideas in a way I kind of looked a lot how I do now then in a way but I was trying to dress female mm -hmm. or feminine whatever um but I had no idea how to dress myself so I just dressed like a complete twat for two years it was like horrific you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah don't go don't don't worry about the terms here right like I think I think this is a difficult conversation to have yeah. in at all right and it's like we're gonna fuck up some terms boys like yeah and we're just gonna keep moving on because it's a very yeah. interesting story so now you would say now you're at this point you're kind of alienated from some of your family but your mother is still <clears throat> your mother's still supportive and you're kind of having some health issues but you're not really seeing it at the time and you're in kind of a state of euphoria from acceptance I would say it was more psychosis because the the thing with blockers that a lot of people don't it's well documented with spirolactin i think it's called um it's known as spiro in the in the trans community it's a anti-androgen that's used in the us mainly and um, we don't use that one here we use the other ones 
uh, the ones that I mentioned before. And these are well known to, especially if you've got a disposition for ADHD, to increase the likelihood of psychosis. Mm. Um, and I think I was just a little bit, I was just off in a, on a different world completely. Um, and I think the ho hormones have got a big part to play in that, um, as well as the online stuff. And, you know, you're getting affirmed online and you're getting affirmed by a doctor and you know, it's very hard. It's a very powerful feeling as well, especially if you're feeling like all your life you've been sort of victimized in a way. Mm. And would you um, say, was there any part of you that felt political as this occurred? No, I was, I was never really too political. I mean, I would occasionally maybe say something on Facebook in jest, but I wasn't like political at all i had no interest in it i was just like yeah whatever I, I think i was political in the sense that you were a bigot if you spoke to me if that makes sense <laughs> like because <laughs> i had that that belief in my head that no matter what you said you were wrong because i'm the authority here um but what i was actually authority on was my own oh trauma. god that's and, and enters the covert narcissism yeah that's it. That's exactly it. Um, I'm the special yeah. victim. I am the special identity. And if you do anything yeah. against my identity, you're an evil, oppressive thing. And all you're yeah. doing is reinforcing that I am the special victim. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Hmm. And so you get to the gender clinic. How, like the process continues. So the moment I got into the gender clinic, which was about, I think it I saw a nurse first. She was mm -hmm. a bitch, um, complete bitch. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, well, my community will know that I hate nurses. All right. No, I that, love nurses. No, 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 I no. Love, listen, she listen. Wasn't a real nurse. Listen, though. Ricky. Listen, Ricky. Real. All right, LPNs and she. RNs. All right, we hate nurses up in here. Nurse practitioners, we love them. All right, and the thing I hate the most. All right. This is just part of the process. The thing I hate the most is what I like to call slut pajamas, which are these nurses that walk around in these tight form fitting scrubs trying to get a doctor. And they think they say they're like, I save lives. I'm the best thing ever. Doctors are so stupid. They would never be able to do anything without me. And it's like, shut the fuck up. You're a nurse. All right. No, we oh, hate no. nurses in here. The moment I hear somebody's like, fuck this nurse. I'm like, I'm all right. I'm for it. I'm for it. Oh, like our nurses are so different here. Yeah, like our nurses are like the, the toughest and the most hardiest, but the most loving uh, set of women. And, well, well, sorry to use a stereotype there, but in my experience, <laughs> women. Anyway, we're back at the gender clinic. So. <laughs> sorry, it was, it was just a funny moment. I apologize. Keep going. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I love I love a tangent. Um. I saw this this horrible um, practitioner. And she was, mm. I think, in all fairness to her, you're getting people who are screaming at you all day about hormones and all this sort of shit. She was just sick of her life, bless her. Um, and I saw psychiatrist. I want to say at the gender clinic. I want to say it was either back end of 2014 or early 2015. Mm. I would have to look through my letters, but. It, it was um, from getting referred, it was about 18 months. Um, because I got referred in 2013. Um, and the first thing that asked is, do you want genital surgery? And I was like, um, fuck, I think so. I don't know. Possibly. I, I've literally just got here. And it was just like, <laughs> do you want genital surgery? And I was like, okay, we'll refer you. And I was like, whoa, what the fuck is happening? And uh, I got a referral letter from the surgeon within like first appointment within months. And I was like, fuck this, this is way too soon. So I was like, no, I don't wanna, don't wanna do it. But I'd heard that if you were on the waiting list for surgery, you could get therapy with the gender clinic, which wasn't offered as standard. It was just something that you could ask for and get, and I just happened to know that you could. So wait, so what you're saying I, is if you were on the waiting list for, um, gender reassignment surgery, um, yeah. then you were more likely to be able to get the therapy as well as the hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. <sighs> so anyway, 
Um, I wanted, I really wanted therapy. I really wanted it. Like I was, I was just desperate to like deal with stuff, but I didn't know. I, I knew I really hungered to deal with my issues, but I didn't know quite understand what all my issues were at that point. And um, I, I saw me gender therapist in 2015. I got discharged in 2020 in total i had 97 sessions with this dude and I, every time it was just like you're trans you're trans you're trans um and i'm because i was fighting back a lot of it and um, mm. so you were it. you were starting to break away you think maybe or yeah definitely so what happened is with the surgery thing is um i got referred again in 2016 and i was like too soon cancel it and then I got referred again in 2016, later end. I was like, fuck this, too soon, cancelled it. And then in um, March 2017, um, I just basically told me down to therapist at this point. Um, nothing to do with surgery, nothing to do with gender. I was like, I think I'm going to kill myself. And I laid out why I was going to do it and how I was going to do it. And I did it in a very calm and assertive way to the point that he was extremely concerned. And it wasn't the first time he'd wrote me, Doctor, about like me talking about this, like in not not just passing like, oh, I'm gonna kill myself. Like I'm thinking I'm gonna just do myself in on Friday sort of talk, you know, right. like very, you know, cut pan. It's like, I just and wanna let you know if I don't show up next time that like, hey, you've been really helpful and like, I appreciate it. And it's like, hey, no, 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 you're gonna come back, right? Like, no, 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 Friday. Maybe I think I'm going to be gone. Well, for me, I've got cats, so uh, they were a big anchor for me. So I was talking oh. about, it's like, I'm, I'm um, giving me cats away. Um, why are you giving your cats away? You love them. Like, yeah, but somebody needs to look after them. Pause for just a second. I have said this to chat multiple times, and they don't believe me. <laughs> the research shows that the number one thing that keeps people from killing themselves is having either an animal or a family member to take care of. Continue. Yeah. Proven. I just, you know, no, it's, please. It's, yeah. It's, 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 right, yeah, I would have killed myself if I didn't mm. have those. And it is a heavy burden for those little animals, but I love them a bit. Um, honestly, you look at your car over there. That's yeah, it's like, I don't, I, don't I, I mean, I feel like I'd be all right without them personally, but, you know, you know I mean, you know, He's a good yeah. kitty. He's a good kitty. He's mostly a dog, honestly. So, um, me, um, therapist is very concerned with us in, in March 2017, really concerned, wrote me GP, crisis mm -hmm. team, which I never heard from um, at all. And then in April, a month later, I had me assessment with a psychiatrist in the, in the gender clinic. And they were like, do I die? Are you getting referred? Like they had no idea that all this was going on. Do I die? Or do you want referred for surgery or not? And I was like, um, no, I don't think I want it. And th there was no mention of like the suicide attempt, what attempt or like talk or anything like that. Um, and I was just like, no, I don't think I want it. And then I had another session with my gender therapist and he kind of convinced us that I needed to do it. So I rang back after that session. I was like, yeah, I want it. Mm -hmm. I want to do it. She referred us. That was like literally three weeks after telling them I was going to kill myself for unrelated reasons. I'm like, yeah, you're fine. Go for fucking surgery. Um, and you know, the, did they the can, did they attempt to connect this to suicidality in any way? No. Okay, I was just curious because I mean, it's, no. a, it's a very big argument in the politics, but I'm just curious if that was used as an angle from the clinic. No, I didn't mention it at all. Okay, just never. It was just like a, uh, you're suicidal. Every every trans person suicidal. It's normal, sort of thing. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I that uh, is gets worse. Um, and then because I realized that as this was going on, that I could see ther me therapist in between. And before you have surgery, you have to have hair removal down below on a certain patch of skin because they, they need to use that inside. And anyway, I'm not going to give you too much details, but I was sabotaging all these hair removal appointments because every time I did, I would get another therapy session and everything would get pushed back. 
because、mm. they couldn't do the surgical referral until the area was clear enough to get the go ahead. And I got another year of therapy out of that more or less. And then eventually it was like you, your referrals went down, and I went down to meet the 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 nurse and the surgeon before, like six months before. And I was like, I was very much under the belief that I I was really unsure if I wanted it, and they didn't talk to us about it at all. And、um, in fact, you know that first psych I mentioned that was a bitch to me, mother.、Mm-hmm. Um, they had sent me back her, to her in 2015, actually, about a year after I'd been for me original first opinion for surgery. And、uh, I said to her, I'm worried about blood loss. I'm worried about complications. And I've got it in black and white. And she was like, "They're extremely rare."、Um, in all my years of service, only two patients out of six hundred have ever regretted it. And I was like, "You've not followed up, have you?" Anyway, and, <laughs> yeah,、uh, yeah that... it was basically like, "That's very rare. I recommend you have it. You'll be a great candidate for genital reconstructive surgery." So I really believed this person. I was like, "Fuck no, I better do it." And、uh, that's one of the referrals that they used for for my surgery as well when I was essentially doubting it. And、um, I eventually I found myself there、um, in, on the operating sort of the hospital in May 2018. And、uh, I remember the night before, just thinking, I don't want to do this. And I was just, I wanted somebody to just say, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do this. My mum was there, and sh- she said something like that, and I was like, I wasn't, I wasn't listening to her. I'd kind of disengaged her off my.、Mm-hmm. Conscious of that word now, I feel awful for that. I didn't even see the surgeon for surgery. I, I, I saw him like once a week after surgery,、um, and I was just like, I, I suppose I better do this because one of the arguments that、um, was put for us was because he'd been on hormones for so long. I had quite a lot of atrophy down below. So everything had kind of shrunk anyway,、mm-hmm. uh, and I'd lost a lot of sexual function because of that atrophy.、Um, and they were like, "Well, it's not being used anyway, and if you're going to stay on hormones, it'll only get worse," which isn't true because it can be on testosterone to help you with that sort of thing. I mean, and、uh, like, like men don't get erectile dysfunction anyways. Like, like I mean, I, I'm just trying to imagine a 50 year old man. Or a forty forty year old man with ED or something, and they're being like, "Ah,、oh, well, you're not using it anyways. Might as well just chop it off." Pretty much. <laughs>、yeah. uh, it was like it was like, "Wait, what are you talking about?" Like, I mean, it's it's I, I mean, it's worthless, right? Like, it's not like part of your body or idea. It's not like we're not gonna actually cause real dysphoria now. Um, it was very <laughs> concerning that everything that happened to the run up and with that and with me as well, and I was just. Mm. I, like I was, I'd believed it adamantly as well that this is what I needed to get better, and I also believed because people had told us that I would just end up killing myself anyway. And so, one of the reasons why I went through it was because the surgeon in twenty, sorry, the psychiatrist in twenty seventeen, who said, "Do you or don't you? Do you want surgery?" Because we're sick of playing this dance, you know. Right. I mean, go. Yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. And、um, and they're like, "Do you want it or not?" And I was like, I panicked because at that point in 2017, the waiting list was five years for the gender clinic,、Oof. and I was shitting myself that if I had changed my mind after getting discharged, I would have to wait another five years. And I'd be like, "How would I ever deal with this genital dysphoria, which I never actually had?"、Um, and I told them I never really had. Any general dysphoria, but you know how I said I had all these therapy sessions and stuff. It was very, very convincing because every time that I said something that was actually addressing maybe a self-esteem issue or something to do with the autism or the sensory stuff, you know, it was just like that's because he trans, that's because he got general do dysphoria. Do you do you feel like another part of this process? And and I don't want to put thoughts. I don't want to like plant seeds, right? I'm just being genuine here. Like that, like you've described a process of constant、um, affirmation. Not a, affirmation, thank you, and and like affirming these things. Was there like a sense of fear 
that like if if you don't go through the gender reassignment surgery that like you're not real right and uh, w was that a part of it from the online space at the same time that yeah. from or, like where was that just the online space was that coming from other places too or like you know, how did that play how did that play i mean if you're if you're pre-op and you're post-op they are two different categories because it's like women will you know not all women behave this way but when you pre-op it's very very different because um you're still armed as some feminists would say you've know? <laughs> <laughs> you still got your own weapon and, uh, uh, so the, that whole dynamic is is much different, but w without it, you you kind of you're one of you know you're safe. You're you're essentially a unit. Like what what harm you're gonna do? Really, you don't have anything to to do anything with. Um, and in on the transfer, it's like part of being part of completing your journey, as it were. Mm. You know, or being being the woman that you're supposed to be, you know, this bullshit. It's all cringe. And you think, how the fuck? You know, I feel like I've been sold a really bad, like, multi-level marketing scheme. And mm. I'm just kind of coming aware of the fact that I've been selling absolute bollocks for the last decade. Um, you know? Mm. So, anyway, back to story time. Um, story surgery. time with Richie, everyone. Story time with Richie. So, surgery went horrifically badly because it was only meant to last like two and a half hours, but it was in theatre for five hours. I had severe blood loss. I'd lost 1600 milliliter recorded, which, like, is a class three hemorrhage. Um, you know, Jesus. You're, you're peaking around on death at that point. And my surgeon even joked in me notes about, oh, curly moment for, for Bucky or whatever the fuck call them like it was nickname i'm sorry uh, can you say that again and maybe be five percent less british <laughs> right so <laughs> yeah he he post he, he on his like sort of review of what happened in surgery he didn't yeah. write it. he had his copy and paste note which was very generic generic mm. and he wrote like seven words in pen which was 1600 milliliters blood loss Explanation mark, explanation mark, curly moment for Bucky, which was his nickname, I think. Um, please call me. And that was the note to me, like to call him. Um, Jesus, it's so impersonal. I, I know, right? And he, he didn't he didn't like say or anything after. And like one of the nurses was like, You need a blood transfusion. Because I was like in and out of consciousness for days. I couldn't remember much. I was totally fucked. And like you should see this one photo. I look like literally like all the lights being sucked out of us. It's like really, really horrific. And um like I they got to about day five before the the essentially were like, oh, we need to do an emergency blood transfusion and give us two units then. And it was they just waited like, five days to give you a blood five transfusion? Days. Five days. She uh, sorry, backstory. Mark and I are both 68 whiskeys um healthcare specialist combat medic um mark oh, really? mark did a tour in afghanistan but we both come from a somewhat medical background and the idea that someone loses that much fucking blood and they wait five days i mean i'd have you on fucking saline immediately prepping for fucking blood transfusion no yeah. it's a, it's a, yeah well <clears throat> there's also uh what are they called? Hex ringers, hex lactates that lactated sort ringers. Of, no, it's a different one. Oh, it's, the new one. Yeah, lactate. Well, you don't want to use lactated ringers on somebody who has a lot of burns. I guess you could use it for for this case because it would pull moisture. Yeah, from pull your the body. interstitial fluid into the. In, was, yeah, but regardless. But a, yeah, fuck? sorry. No, continue. He, yeah, I just. He said uh, he said I was he's one of his biggest bleeders in twenty years, and I was like, okay, cool, thank you for that. That's awesome. This wasn't uh, a botched tooth removal. This was your life. I know, right? It's fucked up. Jesus, I just. <laughs> I, 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 well, it's just from a medical perspective, you know, patient care is about the relationship with the patient in a lot of ways, and that level of impersonality. I mean, obviously it happens from surgeons more so than a lot of other people, but 
that that's unacceptable behavior in any surgery setting. And you're mm-hmm. talking about removing some, like you're talking about a life altering experience in terms of yeah. genitalia. I just, I, I, I'm sorry. That, that's all I can say. I don't know. Like, that's just horrific. Yeah. It's pretty fucked up. The whole thing is like, if you, you need to really watch, I know it's hard to, but you need to watch a video of what happens. It's like totally, absolutely savage. It's, fucking nothing beautiful about that whatsoever this everyone in the chat if you find a video please do not post it in the discord chat that is clearly to us <laughs> yes i'm just throwing that out there uh, but yeah so you uh, had the uh, surgery you get the blood transfusion um and i've i've got it's really hard to explain but if you imagine a like a u where and at the bottom of the u is where the vagina is on the side there you've got these two lines which are sutra and they're kind of stitching you up all together one of mine just popped open on one day right and it was like they came back and they, they didn't need to do anything with it but they were like mm, you might need like revision or whatever on that one and i kept changing up again and again and again and again i also went home with the catheter and all this shit and i've had problems with the waterworks since like I, I pay at like 10% the rate I used to you know just dribbles out and it's so slow and all the random pain and stuff but um anyway the what was I talking about with this fucking horrible thing um sorry I just lost my train of thought no it's um, take how, take as much time as you need honestly I don't remember what what it was oh yeah so I've got my sutra scar that essentially burst open and uh, I emailed them and emailed them months after and I've essentially got a dent in me crotch area because of it and the they just they just didn't fix it and they, they were just like they refused to essentially they were just ignoring us and then I emailed them again out of frustration in like 2021 I was like are you gonna do anything about this or not and they were like well why didn't you do anything about this at the time and I was like fucking hell like I just literally and, and I showed them the email chains and uh, they just don't give a shit. They really don't give a fuck. Like once you're in there, they're like, you should be grateful. Like this is getting done for free sort of thing. And this is um, why we don't advocate for socialized healthcare chat. <laughs> Cause in America uh, they care because yeah. you pay them. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I was like, I was in bed bound for months and I was off work for nearly a year. Oh my God. And, um, I was just, to- I was just totally fucked. And uh, I was on a lot of pain meds too, by ages. And um, like- Did anything come from those pain meds? Did you suffer any like addictive personalities or anything or? Um, I had an addiction to Nefepam for quite a while, but I don't know if you have Nefepam there. What is, what is Nefepam? Nefepam, it's glorious is what it is. And I don't want to talk about it too much because it is beautiful drug. Like it really is. Bring it <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> disavow, <laughs> disavow chat. Um, <laughs> we have our own issues with pain medication here in America. Thank, uh, thank God for Purdue Pharma and the FDA. Um, but continuing. So you were bedridden for a year, basically, well, for three months, well, out of work for a year. Bedridden. Uh, yeah, I mean, luckily I had the support of um, employer, um, which is one of the reasons why I transitioned as well, because I knew I'd be supported. Mm. Um, and That's interesting. Yeah. Can I dig on that a little bit? Yeah, you said I can't talk about work. Well, not about your specific employer, but yeah. in a more meta conversation. Ah. You, like okay. the, the idea that like, you know, if you're... If you are someone suffering with OCD and ADHD and mental issues and trauma, maybe you're crazy. But if you're a trans person, you know that your employer or that the other people in society kind of like have a support system there for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, totally. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, I didn't know it was your current employer, so I'll back off. Please continue. Um. Yeah, so recovery when hit miss, I had two revision surgeries, one which was a local uh, anesthetic 
where it was like I was awake. It was just meant to be a quick procedure because I had all these problems with my waterworks, you know. And um, I was in agony, like, because uh, imagine I had a constricted urethra. So imagine a straw that had been bent and you're mm -hmm. trying to like, suck liquid out of it. You can't, can you? Because it's bent. That's exactly what was happening with mine because they change everything, they reconfigure it. And the, the, the urethra issue is quite a common issue because mm -hmm. of what they're doing. They're, they're bringing it forward and bending it, and it's, it's horrific. So I've had it cut like three times. Ooh. Do you get like a lot of UTIs and stuff? Um, yeah, I also need to get it um, dilated, which you have to have general anesthetic for the urethra itself. Um, I've got to get that done every two to five years, and I'm on a waiting list for that to get done. But that doesn't Fucking always work. Waiting lists, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, and basically, I had another general anesthetic in. Like, I went back to sleeping. I had another day in hospital to for to see if they could fix the issues, but it it didn't. It, it worked originally then for quite a few months, but then the problem just came back. Um, and also, like I said, it's extremely painful. Um, it's very different from an actual vagina. It doesn't self-lubricate unless if you go for the colon, us, the colon graft, I can't remember the proper name, um, you do get some lubrication, but that's colon fluid, which smells like actual shit. Um, so you you know you can have lubrication at the ex expense of a, a shit smelling vagina, which sounds absolutely fucking awful, doesn't it? Yeah, it uh, does. Uh, it does. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, so didn't go for that one. So fortunately, I don't have what's called a stank ditch. Um, I'm sorry. Is that a is that a is that a medical term or? No, that's a slur. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's a great term though. <laughs> <laughs> Oh fucking! I love British people sometimes. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Richie. Um, so, I guess so. You're accepting of your identity at this point still. Yeah. Or but you said that you were the pieces before of the puzzle. Surgery. Yeah, before surgery, I was like, if I don't do this, I'm gonna detransition. If I don't have surgery, I'm gonna detransition. I knew I wanted to detransition. And I knew if I had surgery, it would make it impossible for me to detransition. And it was like, because to me, detransition didn't mean what I understand it to mean now. Mm. To me, it was going back, going back as in the way I was before, anxious, mentally, yeah. Depressed, totally fucked up. So if you say to somebody, have you ever thought about detransition? They'll go, go back, fuck that. And you're like, well, of course you wouldn't be the same again, would you? No one's the same. But mm. they think, and I thought, that I would just be going back to the way I was before. But that's just not the case. You, so you don't go back. Do you, you feel like maybe in some ways, like, because of that thought process, the idea of gender reassignment surgery was like, if I do this, I can, I can, I can have past the point of no return. Yes. Like, I can, like, I'll, I'll, I'll commit to this, and now I can't go back, and I don't have to worry about that additional yeah. doubt or anxiety about going back to that previous state. Yeah, that's yeah. You've done this a few times when you've really encapsulated the point really well. So thank you so much for that, Scott. I, that is a perfect um, description of what was happening. I suppose so it was very much like I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going back. If I go back, I'll die and all this sort of because there is an <laughs> yeah. obsession with death, you know. I, everyone's trying to kill me. Everyone's trying to wants me dead, and you know. Whereas the irony is the biggest threat to trans people is themselves. Hmm. So we move forward. What what started happening um, as you you know as you're going through this nightmare process? So, um, I'd, I I basically I kind of just got ditched by the trans community like around that point anyway for other happenings that were, were going on because I'm a person of morals, I'm afraid, and I've got a hard time letting people get away with what I would consider grave injustices. And I don't want to go too much into that deal, but let's just say somebody was acting rather unfavorably. Um, and I, it would always turn out that I was the bastard, I was the bigot, and if I was to 
challenge people when they were talking utter bullshit, when they were saying you can't say this word, you can't say that term, whereas a year ago you could say that term. I was like, no, you can't say that. I've just said it. What What, what happened? Did you die? No. <laughs> it's like, oh, fucking calm down, sit down. Um, and, you know, it was just that over and over and over again. And um, m- my mask really started to slip in like, 2020, 2021, I was reading Kiwi Farms all the time, which <laughs> fucking love Kiwi Farms. Like they... So so hold on, pause. Are you about to tell me that your transition was because of the internet and your detransition <laughs> begins because of the internet? Is yeah. that where we're going with this story? That's exactly where we're going with this story. The internet <laughs> is responsible for it all. <laughs> You, you also it keep in mind like I've I'm trying to gently pop the bubble on myself that this is this isn't for me and I've made a terrible error of judgment in myself and I accept it's not all of me um, but I do take responsibility I'm not going to be one of these people like I was led into it 100 percent and all these one second guys. one second. Sorry, just looking at chat and making sure we stay within TOS. Continue, please. Oh shit, what have I done? Have I done you haven't done, done anything. You haven't done anything. Don't worry. Okay. Um, what was then? I apologize. Yeah. Sorry. So you were saying that you were in this community and you were, um, you were canceled all the time. Yeah, and then yeah. you started going into like kiwi farms. You started yeah. looking online. You started like being like, okay, I don't fit in in this space. Like, well, fuck it. I'm going to go out on my own and just kind of like explore, I guess. Right. I was just like, I agree with these people, but I shouldn't. <laughs> and I was like, and, and, and like some of the things this is really harsh, but it's really funny. Some of it, like, and I was just, please addicted. say it. I, I can it, but like a lot of the things they were saying were just really, really like real and cut to the bone and because it was people who were similar to me in the sense of like you know male autistic perpetually online all the time i I listened to them um and really really like started reading what they were saying and um i I became more aware to the lunacy in in my waking life and uh and and then i started realizing after that that I, w- I just wasn't comfortable. I just wasn't happy. I was passing. I could hear, like I sounded the part and I looked the part and I had all the acceptance because everyone's like, oh, you detran, detran, people only detransition because of no acceptance. It's like, actually, it's not. It's not because of that at all. Mm. Um, ironically, a lot of the, the, the detransitioners n- normally like look the part quite well, especially the the male ones it's really interesting mm, yeah I don't know if it's dynamic or not I don't know um and I could it, it be maybe until... could it be maybe that like there's no there's no dragon to chase any longer right like if you look the part yeah. well yeah. and you pass fully now you're like okay well I'm here I'm at the end place and yet yeah. I still feel the same I still feel shitty like yeah. i gotta start looking inward whereas people that like never quite pass maybe they're like well this un- i can still blame this uncomfortableness on the way society treats me because i'm seen as otherized and different fucking nailed it again scotland you're on fire and i well done dude <laughs> i appreciate yeah. it no really, really i mean good. i've looked into it a bit you know <laughs> no 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 that is spot on that is 100 percent right i just um i can't and I can't really follow up on that because that is true. Um, you do get to a point where you get bored in a way mm. of like, but not like, oh God, I'm, I'm bored because like everyone thinks I'm bored. Like I, people, though, I wasn't all the time. If I didn't make an effort, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have passed. But that's just the same with a lot of people. I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was so fucking paranoid and so fearful. Like every every passerby, every car, every passenger, and every car, I was looking. Well, were they looking at me? And you know, I'm I'm looking around like this, and then people are looking at us because I'm looking like a fucking nutter, looking at everyone, <laughs> and I'm like, they're looking at me, and it's just like, yes. And what one of my friend was like, 
why the fuck are you just eyeballing everyone? And I'm like, I'm not eyeballing everyone. It was like, yes, look at you. you, you you're like, you're saying people are looking at you, but you, you're looking at everyone else. And it was like, and then I started really thinking about that. And it was like, I'm not comfortable like this, like how I was. And um, then I found the D-Trans community and I found a lot of D-Trans stories in 2021, which was a slow and painful process, but eventually found a good, the D-Trans community at the end of last year. Mm. And then um, I'd been, I've been in there for the last few months and then, well, about six, seven months now. And uh, in March, I was like, I'm just gonna socially detransition because they always say, oh, just cut your hair, change your name nothing's gonna change you know what i mean mm-hmm. so I, like i got a i was like i want a haircut but i don't want to like try and be like this ultra masculine guy that i'm not anyway i was like i want to get a, a haircut out one so i went for like this sort of haircut. right like like you know i don't want to i don't want to like look like a gym bro like you go to the hairdresser yeah. and you're like bts like i want to look like <laughs> bts like let's go <laughs> I was like, I want to look like an emo from 2006 that's just about to write an angry post in MySpace. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, it my suits you. It suits you. You're like, fine. Yeah, You're fine. Um, and, so, and, then okay. I, and then I just found that I was just, the fear would gone. Like, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't like, I didn't have whatever I had before. It was just like, this is so much fucking better. I just like it. And it was like, yeah, one or two people still looking at us because I'm, you know, I've got an unusual look, I suppose, because I look older, but I don't have the, the the facial hair sort of thing. You know what I mean? It's a very weird look. Right. Um, so, you know what I mean, I, I again, I, I stated in DMs and everything, like you know, if we go too far, we go too far. Just say pass. I'll tell you it's I'm fine. So this is this is the hardball before the free form. I, I, cause I, I have to ask because I think it's important, um, in terms of the permanence of the damage, wh- what uh-huh. do you feel is permanent? And and what I mean by that is if you feel comfortable explaining any of the physical things, you, you went into that some with your spine and the hormones and the bone density, but also if you feel comfortable going there, which I understand if you don't about your sexuality, about mm-hmm. gender reassignment surgery and about how has that affected you sexually and your ability to have healthy relationships, not just mentally and emotionally, but in that other regard, or has it not? Um, it has, I've been like, I, I literally can't have sex. Like I just can't have it. it just doesn't work. It's like, I was always low libido when I was younger anyway. And mm-hmm. um, part of the reason why I wanted to do this was to escape my sexuality when i eventually found my sexuality i'd kind mm. of found myself fucking lobotomized because i can't you know just can't do it engagingly mm-hmm. as it were um it's gone for life you know i'm literally a eunuch like mm. i'm not post up i'm a eunuch and do you mean that both from a physical standpoint and a libido standpoint or is it more so one or the other and and, and i guess what i mean to say specifically and i know that this is harsh right um but do you find yourself um in a bottom relationship at all or is the libido in such a place where you're uncomfortable with with what is going on and it's just like no please don't touch me i would i wouldn't like i wouldn't say no i would definitely want to i think but it it's gonna require someone with a great deal of understanding Mm. and it's just like you know, if that person comes along, they come along, but I wouldn't expect anyone to, you know, if somebody was like, this is too much for me, I'll be like, I understand. Yeah, right. Fair just, enough. But like, again, I'm not, because um, a lot of this is like, it's so weird. It, it, it kind of keeps people young and it kind of, I don't know, kind of, just it, it sexually lobotomizes you in a way like you become uninterested in sex mm. um funnily enough and uh you just I, I don't know i just don't have i never had the hunger anyway that a lot of people had I never had a high sex drive but now it's it's fucking non-existent because of it um and one of the things i've talked to with other 
um, D-trans males, one who was a few years old as he had a really bad psychotic episode. He was like, he's been D-trans like three, four years now. And um, his testosterone got up and up and up and he started getting really high libido and he just couldn't do anything about it. And mm. it literally drove him into a psych ward. And I was like, I don't want that. I really don't want that. I don't want to be to that point where you're going to feel like you're going to explode. I'd rather just remain the way I am. Um, unfortunately, it's like the better of, sh- of a shit choice, you know? Mm. Oof. And, and was there any other kind of permanent things mm, physically that you can describe that are like issues to this day that... Or would you say it's pretty much that? <laughs> I would say that that's a pretty big one. I would say yeah, it's that. a pretty I've big got, one. Yeah. Yeah, I've got my endo, endo system totally fucked up. I'm sleeping like a lot. Like, I've never slept this much in my life. I'm really tired. I've got zero strength, by the way, zero. It's just gone completely. Um, I'm embarrassingly weak and I do worry if. What would happen if, if, you know, if somebody came up to us and started giving us a problem, I'm not in the position I was when I was 24, 25, where I could quite easily defend myself. Whereas now, I'm totally fucked. Like, if somebody attacks me, I'm just fucked. Another reason that you need to just, Richie, that you just need to get to America, all right? Because in America, we have these things called guns, all right? (laughs) And and they're they're very effective tools in situations such as that. Yeah, right? Um, (laughs) Anyway, I don't want to get into that topic. (laughs) I'm I'm just messing with you. You seem like a cheeky kind of individual in DMs and stuff. I figured it would it would spruce up, you know, going from talking about your sexual lobotomy um, to uh, a quick uh, a quick joke on the day of a mass shooting, of course, no less. Oh dear, um, yeah. So autoimmune issues, um, tiredness, fatigue, strength, mm-hmm. physical issues too. Um, but hey, I look younger than I am, so yeah. There's that. Uh, also, I mean, I think I would, I mean, it's, it's, it was quite self-evident, you know, just from this, um, mentally, like, I think, like, how do you, how do you feel now coming out the other end? You know, I have good days and bad days. Some mm-hmm. days are really difficult. I'm not going to lie. It's not something that you're going to get over. Mm-hmm. No problem. Um, and other days, I'm really good. Really like I'm enjoying being outside a lot more. I was compl- I never, I rarely went out still when I trans. Um, but now I'm like out walking like two or three times a day. I'm just, I'm just liking being outside and not worrying and not, you know, I feel like I've, yeah, <laughs> it feels like I'm doing everything on an easier difficulty. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, it's like <laughs> when you, do you know, Cause now whenever I'm playing like a single player game, I always go for like the hardest difficulty. Like, cause I'm like, I want to, I want to challenge. I want to really try and struggle Yeah, not through. me, not me boys, then, not me boys. We play on journalism mode here. And then you, then you go back on easy mode and you're like, what the fuck is this? And it was just like, and that's kind of like life. It's like, I feel like I went back on easy mode. And I know I've got issues and problems, mm. um, but everything does feel a lot easier now. And I feel yeah. a lot quite confident to speak about it because it's like some of the depression of lifts. Yeah, I mean, what a lot of people don't tend to realize is, I mean, I've been dealing with this for like quite a number of years before I got to this point. So I didn't get this point and be like, oh my God, I'm doing trans, I've ruined my life and I need to fucking tell everyone about it. It was like, I'd been through all that shit before I started writing all my mm. fucking memoirs. And I remember... Shit. I remember back when I was, you know, an edgy teen of my of my own years. Um, there was this lyric from uh, Modest Mouse that always spoke to me because I always thought it perfectly encapsulated like what depression feels like. And it was yeah. um, I didn't float on. No, it's not float on. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of float on. But uh, it's uh, I didn't go to work for a week. Um, I didn't leave my bed for eight days straight. I haven't hung out with anyone. Um, and if I did, I wouldn't have anything to say. Yeah. And like, and I think that like kind of 
sometimes I always just kind of like think of that when, when people are describing that experience. And it sounds like some of that for you has lifted despite being physically weaker and despite having days that are rough. You know, it's yeah. like, no, no, I'll leave my bed. I'll go outside. I'll get some goddamn sun. And obviously yeah. you have something to say because you came here today to to tell your story. And I'm I'm really happy that you did so. It's it's a powerful story. Thanks. Thanks for having me. No, of of course. I mean, it's uh it's crazy. Um the thing that worries me now is that your story is becoming all too common now. Well, this is the point. This is what I'm trying to tell people that it's not one percent. It's quite high. I would surmise it's probably hitting the region of about thirty to thirty-five percent at the minute. Um, we we're seeing we're seeing that now in California. It's it's gonna take it, it's gonna make rapid onset gender dysphoria look tiny. Like <sighs> people are just gonna <laughs> off it. And um, the second that like medical places start getting a whiff of legal stuff coming their way, they're gonna withdraw too. Um, it's gonna it's gonna be a real shit show because um, there aren't any winners in this, and there's not gonna be any celebrations, you know. I don't know. I'm, I I worry that there will be celebrations where everyone forces a smile. Maybe, but I, I, there is no real sort of coming back from this. That you won't, you know, it, it's not, you're not going to celebrate it. It won't be celebrated in the future of people mm. coming out of this. It won't be, it'll, it'll be looked on as a very, very dismal period of time. Well, hopefully, you know, when, hopefully we come out of the other end of this and people like you will be, you know, the, um, I don't know. You might, you might, you, Richie. Your name might go down in history. Who knows, right? You, 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 and a few others might be, might be in textbooks. So the first people that really started to speak out in a way that was meaningful. I think. Last year, well, there was a lot of people before me. So. Yes, yes, of course, of course, and and we try and do the same thing, but we do so. I think, and this is why it was so interesting and lovely to have you here, was because we do very boring conversations on this that sound conspiratorial. You know, I, I go and debate a lot of left-wing people that are very bought and sold into this ideology, um, which I like to call gender Marxism. I don't yeah, like to call it. Um, I, that, that's my preferred term. Um, but, um, you know, it's what we are seeing is is an escalation. I'm not seeing the fight back, the swing back just yet. Um I'm seeing an escalation because I'm seeing things like, you know, one of the things that's the the scariest thing for me that I've seen lately is, is the insistence on teaching teachers transformative social emotional learning. Um, and you said that you weren't really aware of this. I've got uh, one of my friends who's the trans. He mm -hmm. is, um, he's Lynn, be a teacher. He's talked a little bit about what's going on in schools, but, um, and it sounds very, very disconcerting. Mm. Uh, yeah so yeah i mean we could we could talk about the politics but i think i think and 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 some of the things that we're worried about but i think we do enough of that on this channel i think this has been a really good interview so far i want to if you're comfortable with it i want to open up my chat to to questions now if you would feel yeah comfortable let's do questions let's go all right so uh q a um if you want to make sure that your question is definitely seen you know just put a q in front of it highlight the message or something um I have one from a while ago, which was, um, and this one is, um, from Angie question. What is your experience? What was your experience like with medical professionals before your transition? Did anyone work with you to understand why you were dissatisfied with being male and try to adjust those issues? I read from others who were quickly slash immediately offered material slash counseling on transitioning versus working with the individuals first. No. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. Just think. I like it. Oh my god, that's. that's I'm sorry. That's that's too funny. Um, Casimir asks um, to Richie, um, do you like reading, and if so, what? Um, I like reading all the corp and seeds on Twitter, but I don't really read much books. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, all the all the what on Twitter? The cope and the seethe. Oh, the cope and the seethe. Okay, sorry. Yeah. sorry. God, I like I like to such call a them, strong accent. <laughs> <laughs> I like to call them cope tweets rather than quote tweets. Fair um, enough. Um, here's one I think might be interesting. Um, do you have any good resources for the thirty five percent, the D trans that you that you were mentioning? Uh, yeah, there was a recent. I'm trying to remember the name. There was a recent study about the um, the assisted. Oh, sorry, the long term care of people who were in the study of trans patients, and thirty five percent had dropped out of the study. They didn't want to take part in the study anymore for unknown reasons. Um, and that could have been a multitude of factors of things. Could have moved house, but it does make you wonder because they had said only one percent who have stayed in the study had detransitioned. When in fact, we need to look at the data that hasn't been formulated. Mm. Why did thirty-five percent of people um, didn't? Why did they not? Um, why did they leave the study? Why aren't they reporting it? And remember, there is no follow-up with gender clinics. They will only know. With if you've detransitioned, if you go off and tell them that you've detransitioned, mm. so it's a follow. hidden statistic at, at, at that point. Yeah, it's yeah. It, it's just about a case of drawing it up. So uh, another question: um, Any advice for a trans sixteen-year-old in the UK? That's a pretty broad question. What? I what, have what do you mean generally? I mean, I'm not going to dox a person, so <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to give information they didn't want to share specifically in chat. No, it's just a, advice for, I mean, it depends what, what advice you're looking for. Are you, are you looking to, for advice in transition? Are you looking for advice on, are you trans? This sort of thing. I mean, it is a very broad thing. The first thing I would say is, and whatever you do, expand on your own gender dysphoria. What other things could it be? And don't rest until you've got a proper understanding. In terms of going through the system, um, I would highly, highly recommend that you make sure that you've got no other comorbidities. Um, and also talk about your parents, talk about your sexuality, talk about autism, talk about any sort of neurodiverse trait you've got. Talk about bullying, talk about trauma, and, you know, if you're lucky enough not to have all those things in tandem, you know, you be for you, you know, but <laughs> um, just take your fucking time as well, you know, and have a real, real think about what, why you're doing this. Um, and, you know, it's going to be very difficult for you at 16 to, to think of that yourself. So I think you've got a big mountain to climb. I'm sorry. I appreciate that. I'm sure, sure Lumi does as well. Um, follow up on the reading question. Are you enjoying the Twitter versus Musk drama and the prospect of more potential revelations on how these things are ran? I think he means Twitter and algorithms that's and that's things like that. Cool. Yeah, ESG scores and all, all of that. And that's like, are you excited about any of those things? I am because there was some very unusual behavior um, at Twitter HQ when Elon first bought it. Um, and it's all logged. Like, they, they can't hide it. Now. Like, they can't hide it. It's going to be, it's going to be absolutely beautiful. But you're, you've already seen the stuff come in about Elon, like saying, this is all a cover for Elon's financial shape drama crap that I don't even um, really give two tosses about to be honest um <laughs> but to me it was it was more so the fact that he's overtook twitter and all the trans people like and loads of people like i'm quitting twitter and everyone's like no one cares fuck off like we're, we're sick of hearing from you anyway you know um but in reference to to what's gonna happen with this i uh, i don't think people will believe it when the truth is revealed Mm. No, it's, no one's going to quite be able to believe it. Another question to Richie. To Richie. Like, the questions are for them. Like, you can ask me questions anytime, Chad. <laughs> um, do you think that gender-affirming surgery is effective for treating gender dysphoria, or should the medical community take a very hard look at treating disorders with therapy? 
I mean, you know, if you had an anorexic girl coming up to you and you said, I want to, uh, what do they call the things when they reduce the size of your stomach? You know, Liposuction. Gastric, gastric bypass. You know, gastric bypass. You know, uh. you, and it, you know, you're dealing with like somebody who's like six, seven stone. You wouldn't do it, you know, but we do it for this. So mm, yes, we, six, seven stone. That's a real measurement, chat. It is. It's uh, there's like what? What is it? Fourteen pounds in a stone or twelve? I can't remember. I think it's. I think it's twelve. I think it's twelve. No, it is real. Um, yeah, but in terms of gender affirming surgery, um, the there is information on there that is already out, and it's already saying that there is no evidence to say that it does increase the longitude. Um. I'm not Scottish, no. Uh, sorry, I just saw that. I had a fucking answer. <laughs> also, it was, uh, it, it it takes was 14 pounds. 14 pounds. It takes, it takes a minute to get... It took me a... I still don't get it. How to engage with chat effectively while also being on stream. And sometimes things just pop out at you. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah, sorry. I've totally blanked the question. It is... Well, whether or not um, gender affirming surgery is effective or efficacious, I should say more more accurately, mm -hmm. and whether or not they should look at treating disorders more with therapy. So you've got a lot of problems with it. I, I think they do need to do more like more therapy around the individual before jumping down to this because you've got a few issues. Like, why are poor stop trans people killing themselves? Like, why would the any, why would anyone do that? Mm. Why is it transphobia or is it the fact that things have went bad and they realized that this wasn't worth it mm. or even went well and it wasn't fucking worth it. It's not all about bad results. Comparatively, despite the horrors, I actually had a good result in terms of I have sexual function, but, you know, it's at what cost? It's just fucking insane. Um, and you, you're in a very weird position when you're panicked. Like, what are you supposed to tell people? Like, yeah, shit, this thing that I have for life. You, you're gonna, you're gonna admit to everyone that it's bad, because then you'd have to admit that to yourself, and you'd have to admit that other people who are waiting for it. And there's this reluctance to say anything negative about the trans experience and treatments in um, in any discourse, and it, it sucks, it sucks so much because, like. That there were people who I would talk to before I'd surgery and I was like, well, what's it like? Is it okay? Is it good? Is it good? And they were like, it's okay. And then you learn after the fact that they've had all these shitty problems, they hate it, but they're just not telling everyone because they don't want to scare other people, but they don't want to acknowledge it themselves. Um, so. You said yourself that there was a, a kind of a, almost like a hive mind around the yeah. certain issues within the community and then even before you were detrans you you know you you described a situation where there were certain taboo topics and certain yeah. things you weren't allowed to say obviously you were referencing some behavior that you don't want to get into but but i mean would that would you include that as well as like within the whole community it's like no no, no we all smile and we all nod and we all at the very yeah. least say it's okay it is it is it's it's all very much um a complicit sort of agreed be kind which basically means shut the fuck up um sort of mantra mm. another question do you think the trans the trans process is more common among male to female trans or female to male trans people and were you aware of anyone who was detrans before you detransition Yes, to I'll answer the second part first. So, the person in me waking life who had so transitioned, they were the first person who had detransitioned. But I had put it down to all the abuse that they had had, because they were they were getting shit from people. Um, they're, they're quite tall, um, and they were they were getting like stares and pointed at and all that horrible stuff. So in my mind, I was like, oh, they detransitioned because they couldn't blend in, whatever. Um, so I had seen it, but I just, it was just like totally ludicrous for me. Um, so the, in, an in unexpected, in, 
sorry, what was the original question again about the... The original the, question was, do you think that the D-trans process is more common among male to female trans or female to male trans people? That was uh, the first female, portion. Um, it's it. So there has been a study and there's an Oxford study done in 2021 that talks about the, the medical needs for people who have detransitioned. And um, it's identified like an average period of time before people spend as trans before detransitioning. So for a woman, it's about 4.5 to 5.5 years. That's how long they spend as trans before detransiting. Whereas males, it's seven to eight years. Now, if you keep in mind 2014 is the boom, that is the trans boom. That's where shit just went fucking skyrocketing. Well, that was eight the years girls, ago. Yeah, girls were right on time because they've been out for the last two years. Speaking, haven't they? Sinead, mm. Helena, Grace, these are very big detrans names. But they're two years ahead of the boys, and the boys are kind of like, oh, it's my turn, because we're socially behind, we're always behind the girls. Like, even in, <laughs> just how even in the trans community, the boys are socially yeah. behind the girls. Yeah. <laughs> isn't, that... so, isn't it, isn't it Check, really... Checkmate, lefties. <laughs> oh, gosh. Richie, so I, I, I read this question, and I'm assuming because this person was here describing the recovery process for the gender reassignment surgery that they're specifically talking about detransing off of HRT. Um, Richie, what was your recovery time? And if I may ask, was it as painful as they say it is? It was about two months ago, I almost started HRT myself. Recovery time for surgery or HRT? I, I think they're talking about HRT because I know that they were in the chat when you were talking about your surgery. Um. I mean, I'm on HRT for life. I, I, yeah. I don't have balls, so I have to take it forever. So I'm kind of fucked in that way. Yeah, so, so the answer on that one is life. That's the recovery life. time. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just... You hear that, and to you, it's your reality, but mm. someone that's not experiencing it, it it's it's heartbreaking. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I can't do anything but other than say that I, I can't even conceivably empathize, uh, 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 sympathize with that, but I'm happy you're here to, to, to say it. Uh, nevertheless, next question. Um, any unexpected slash interesting side effects you experience while taking hormones during the transition? Curious to hear the male perspective on it. If these hormones slash blockers, et cetera, made them feel more feminine, emotional, et cetera, how much of a difference felt from prior and any gender related nuances learned? Yeah, I did learn um, a lot about the female experience, she was safe, because especially when you're like the non-threatening passive, like basically the version of trans whatever I was, it was very non-threatening. You kind of get let in a lot more with women and, um, you know, it was just a whole different set of conversations I hadn't really had before. Um, in terms of like a doors became automatic, you know, they're just people just opening doors for us all the fucking time, which was really <laughs> interesting. Um, big differences, you know, like you, you, I noticed like conversation, you would, you would be totally like ignored. It was a weird thing to be in a, in a meeting and say something and then have someone else repeat that and then be like, oh, that was fucking weird. I just said that. Um, and there was these, all these little like differences, but the, the most significant thing for me, I think, was because I'd took on um, a female identity, I was, I would allowed myself to be more emotional. Mm. Uh, and I'd wanted to, um, so I got distracted by a pop. I need to stop looking at that bloody thing. I, <laughs> turn on I told you, you didn't even need to be in watching I know, the chat. I, 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 know I told you, I said, just I come in. I said, because people, uh, I'm luckily, you, uh, luckily, I don't know how, but we avoided the hate watchers tonight. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I think at a certain point they've, they've realized that I've, I've kicked all, I've kicked all of their favorite streamers asses in debates at this point. So I've avoided okay. the hate streamers. Um, you, you'll find that a lot of them won't want to listen to what I've got to say because they're so fearful that they might uh, see themselves in me and they will. Mm. Um, well, absolutely. I fear that I haven't answered the question fully. Um, 
the original one, unexpected benefits. So Being able to like sort of deal with the emotions a little bit more, maybe. But other than that, I was, you know, I heard some trans people say like, oh, I'm crying twice a day. I'm like, what the fuck? Go see someone, man. They're like, that's not normal. <laughs> and I'm like, I'd, I'd maybe okay, ask. to pick apart that a little bit, um, yeah. I, I found what I find really interesting about your answer, and I want to maybe like pull it apart a little bit, is you say you allowed yourself to be more emotional. That by yeah. taking on a gender role, right, by playing a part, you felt maybe more comfortable to be able to express those emotions in a societal context, while you weren't, you didn't necessarily feel like you were, the hormones were making you more emotional in any significant way. And furthermore, you describe other people saying that. And so my question to you would be, do you think they were sincere about that? Or was that more of playing the role to the public? So there's two things going on there. I think one, you're quite right again, that there is a play in it up a bit. And there's a lot of that unresolved stuff that they're getting out and they're getting out in a very unhealthy way. And the second point is, is that overdosing on estrogen in males can create neurosis and psychosis which can make you very tearful so if you're crying all the time that means that your estrogen is far too high um, and that's that can cause a lot of damage to your brain actually all the time and it's not something to flaunt or be proud of and um, because excess estrogen in males is known to decrease um, gray matter volumes in the brain all the time which is one of the key causes of dementia high estrogen in males just like it is with high testosterone in females. All right, you do you that. you uh, you definitely make no bones about what you say. And Jesus, uh, so I have a, a a last question in case any other one. Oh, sorry, one more before that. Uh, was the pushback instant after detransitioning, or only after you became vocal about it? Um, I had the normal, you know, if you're going to do trans, don't be anti-trans, speak from people, just be careful, you know, and I was like, yeah, okay, I'm not going to, not going to do anything too drastic, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> he says now. <laughs> and then uh, I was just like, you know what, fuck it, no one else is, um, no one else is doing it again. Mm. Yeah. No one else. Yeah. So I mean, I there are a like, few, but. But no, I mean, like in the in the sense that there are male detrans people speaking up, which is great. Like I'm involved in a group of them, for instance, so we do coordinate a lot. Um, but there there wasn't really anyone who was willing to be like, I don't really care if I get lots of abuse, and I'm like, who could do that? Well, I'm mostly cancelled by my local community anyway. Don't care. Um. I have been using the internet for 25 years, pretty much. So I'm well, well used to spiciness online. I'm pretty sure I can handle it. Yeah, Richie remembers and Xbox oh, Live Chat. It's okay, boys. Fucking hell, it was well before then. Like, I was way before that, man. Way before that. And, and. Mm. Uh, so, what's your age, sex, location, ASL? My ASL. No, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Just hearkening back to the old internet. Oh, oh god, yeah, that was that was some nostalgia flashback. That <laughs> Damn. Um, an another question, and this one is, it says harder, so consider whether or not it's worth it. But I figure, fuck it, we'll ask anyways. Casimir is one of one of our. Uh, well, he's uh first of all, he's Russian, so he's very blunt, and second of all. He's very philosophically minded, so it'd be interesting to, to ask this. Do you think that there could have been a hidden value in the lack of tolerance and push towards normativity in societies of the past, where that pressure, despite being oppressive, was also protective? Um, yes, because if you look at the ideologies, not just this ideology, but all the other ideologies, that are in motion, in tandem together. It seeks to d destroy the bond between people, not just families, but your neighbor um, and your friends. And, you know, it's all about questioning everyone's motives, being untrustful and, you know, and being belonging to a tribe. Uh, whereas before it was very much your tribe was your nation. 
not your political belief. It was like queen and country through and through everywhere. Um, and, you know, patriotism in every country was like that. And then now it's just changed into a, into a, um, well, it's a shit show now. That's what we'll have. <laughs> no, um, that's, I mean, uh, you know, that's not how an ANCAP, an anarchist would answer that question, but it is insightful nevertheless in terms of the way the culture is certainly, um, I think a great, a great book that, um, that I read that I would recommend to anybody is Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam and mm -hmm. talking about how the modern society and industrialization, but specifically the, you know, after the baby boomers, the social capital that has been destroyed in our, in our culture um, is an interesting read. And I think that might be kind of a chicken or egg scenario. This isolation that we have, despite everything, this isolation from our communities, our families and everything really drives people towards insane and radical echo chambers online where they can feel a part of a community, but it's, it's a false community. It's not a, it's not a community that's made by the bonds of work, by the bonds of blood, by the bonds of, you know, real attachments to real world things. Instead, it's pick an identity, pick a belief, and we'll all have this identity or belief together, no matter where we are in the world. And we'll all, reaffirm it to the absolute ends of insanity yeah do you think this has anything to do with a lack of like scott this is more scott's lanes uh so <laughs> you <can> probably <laughs> but you can correct my phrasing because i'm sure you'll understand what i'm trying to get at but like this uh like with the way public schooling is now or just schooling like it's very much sit down be still memorize facts it, it's a lot of things are, are more targeted towards girls. And it seems like you trying to transition to a woman might have helped to speed that process up. Mm, maybe, but also you've got to keep in mind on how boys are trapped when they express um, male behaviors, when they are trying to like um resolve their their desire to have rough play and stuff like that and or maybe they want to uh, like express their energy their masculine energy or whatever it is and they get told that they're being aggressive and they need to sit down shut up or they need to be medicated or they're a bit too hyperactive and they need to be medicated so they're just kind of like sat squarely not knowing what the fuck to do and i feel really sorry for them it must be torturous um and it is it is a complete breakdown of of kids of their own autonomy and i mean i really worry for their what their anxieties are going to be like when they grow up it's going to be horrific can you imagine it'll be absolutely terrible hmm. uh, everything's been ripped to parts and everything's a danger everyone's a threat they're not allowed to express themselves um but to answer your question of is things more appealing as a girl it's more appealing as a gay person when you lived in a very homophobic environment um, and in a whole world and stuff that is telling you that this is this is terrible but this is actually really beautiful and brave but this isn't you know so it was very 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 appealing for me mentally to to latch on to the idea I was trying to not gay I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm cutting off questions now but I got two more questions and then uh and then we can, you know, wrap up. Um, but um, Kodashiku asks, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but... Can I just jump in and say, fuck furries, man? I, fucking I was gonna... No, I was gonna leave that question as the last question. That's why I was cutting off the question, was so that you could end on a high note. Uh, you, you fucked it up, Richie. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, all right, so that's your, that's your answer for that question. Oh. Oh man, it was going to be so much better that way, but it's okay. I appreciate your candor and your uh, readiness to say fuck furries. <laughs> um, are the issues within the community you are in common between individuals or do they all seem unique to the individual, making harder to relate to others going through the same thing? I'm not sure that I quite understand the question. Maybe you do. No, I know, I know, I know what he's saying. He, what he's trying to say is, oh, they, or she, or the, or bug, or fake. He, it's um, fucking he, but... <laughs> Look, it's Twitch. It's Twitch chat. Just assume it's a man, and you're right like 95 percent of the time. 
Okay. Um, yes, everyone has very similar issues. Very carbon, carbon copies of issues. Um, it's like really, really telling. All right, fair enough. Um, so, yeah, Richie, um, thank you so much for coming, sharing your story. Um, you know, can I say one more thing about furries? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. All you want to say about furries, go ahead. So yesterday on Twitter, I got dogpiled, and I thought it was painfully ironic that half of them. I think it's ironic that you use the term and... dogpiled, but continue. This is what I'm saying. Like getting dogpiled by a bunch of fucking furries. Like, it was really funny. <laughs> like, irony. And they're like, oh. all these people trying to give a shit, and they're like, this is so sad and pathetic. And I'm like, mate, you've got a fucking animal as your avatar. Like, get fucked. And yeah, it's, like... not it's not even a real cat. Like, you know what I mean? It's it's like you as a cat. Like, go fuck yourself. Seriously. Anyway, cut that from the internet. Whatever. That never happened. <laughs> anyway, thanks for having me. Yeah, a, I, I, I want to know, like, do you have anything that you want to say any advice that you want to give any things you want to like pimp out like you know your sub sack or you know or follow you on yeah. twitter or you know like any of those things like whatever you want to leave this interview and not feel like there was anything left on set um okay i mean I'm, i've made me peace with fairies like I, I think those those feelings are a bit <laughs> um, for me i would say Please, if you know anyone who's thinking about transition or detransition, get them to have a look at detrans stories. Get them on detrans Reddit. Red, it's Reddit slash r slash detrans. Um, it's a great source of support. Helped me massively. Um, and you know, it like I said, it's it's probably the one thing that I would put, like pick up the most. There there are so many good Twitter accounts. That I couldn't sit here and name them all, you know. Um, but yeah, I would say Reddit Detrans. Is well, pimp, great... pimp your Twitter in the chat since you're in the chat, and then they'll eventually find all those other wonderful Twitter accounts by following you. Yeah. I'll I'll pop a link in for you. There you go. As me freaking window. <laughs> Did you just respond with wolf? <laughs> <laughs> so Mike just types wolf. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh I have a recommendation. Please consider reading books, particularly anything old that can be described as classic. Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And there you uh, go. Get us some like treatment from the ADHD. Then we'll talk about reading books, right? <laughs> Audiobooks. But I don't know if he was necessarily talking specifically to you. All oh, right, okay. Like to okay. everyone else, like you know, read some fucking philosophy. Ground yourself in um in a in a in a meaningful way of being able to view and process the world. Yeah. I think good check. philosophy is a is a is an antidote to a lot of ideologies. And don't be a fairy. And don't fairy. be a furry. I feel like that's the perfect outro for you. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um Richie, it was a wonderful interview. Um, you know, I'll post the link on. You know, we'll we'll throw it up tomorrow on um, on YouTube or whatever, and get it to you. And I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. See you soon, guys. Also, make sure your DMs are closed on Discord now that you've now that no people <laughs> know what your Discord is. I'm just throwing that out there. You know what I mean? Uh, no, whatever. It's it's sort of like this. So. Yeah, well, you know how Discord works. But uh, thank you so much. Right. I appreciate it. No, it was a pleasure. For me. And you. Thanks for having me, both of you. Take care. Take care. Bonsoir. You just watched a clip from our Twitch channel, Fabian Liberty. If you like content like this, please like and subscribe here on YouTube, or go ahead and give us a follow on twitch.tv backslash Fabian Liberty.